wine to call out Paris to live the wax to kill the building. Oh, how you doing? How you doing? Turn the music down. My wow, people, how you doing? Your favorite outsiders who is watch you back in the building, my people, today. Oh, man, I'm so happy to be back. I'm so happy to be here. My people, today uh, we're going to talk about this book. We have the brother who wrote the book on the show. Oh man, it's going to be wonderful. I read the book. I loved it. I loved it. And I um, I discovered the book on Mobali Makasi. My people tune in and watch Mobali Makasi in French. Oh man, and I've been watching so many videos from... Uh, the Hidden Science of Melanin, the Hidden Science Academy. I love it. So I can't wait to talk to the author and bring it to you, my people. Welcome to the show. Share the show everywhere that you are. Uh, Canada, USA, UK, everywhere, my people. Welcome to you and I. <laughs> All right, my people, so let's get into it. Let me bring Leon Marshall into the show right away. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Brother Leon Marshall. Oh, my goodness, I love your work. Uh, once once I saw you on Mobari Makasi, I was like, okay, I'm hooked up. I'm going to go to his YouTube channel and watch everything, all the videos. And um, I saw all those events that you, you, you have, you host events mm -hmm. and you're teaching people like in a, in a university setting, but you're mm -hmm. demystifying and simplifying things that have been so complicated for a very long time. And I was like, Oh my goodness, this is the kind, this is my kind of scientist. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sister. And thank you for uh, inviting me to your show. It's a real honor to be on your show and a pleasure. I cannot wait for this interview. I cannot wait for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the hidden science of melanin, everybody get the book. I put the link to the book in the description of the show. Get the book. Now, we've always heard about melanin, mm -hmm. but we have no idea what it is. So this kind of demystified and simplified it for me. And I'm like, I want you to demystify it and simplify it for the audience. But obviously, they have to get the book because that's when they're going to get the full information. Mm -hmm. And then the thing that is so captivating about it is that it also affects the lifestyle, the food that we eat, you know. And so it's so important for us to know about this because it affects everything. Mm -hmm. um, so what was the motivation for you uh, in, in the process of writing this book? You know, like what yeah. pushed you to write it? Well, I'm a sports science lecturer at London South Bank University. And throughout my years of studying science, I felt like there was gaps in the knowledge. Like every time I'd learn science, I'd just feel like there was things they weren't telling us. And... Uh, when I was studying sports science, they talked about anatomy and physiology. So how the body works. Anatomy is how what we're made up of. Physiology is how it all works. So when I'm looking through the anatomy and physiology books, one, I don't see anyone who looks like me. So that grabbed my eye. So when I'm looking through all of these science books, they don't, you don't see anyone who looks like us. And then two, little things like they, they show an image of the brain and they'd show all of the glands in the brain, but for whatever reason, they'd miss out the pineal gland. 
And I had that, these times that when I was younger, 10, 15 years ago, I didn't know a lot about the pineal gland, but I knew it was a gland in the brain and I knew it was quite important. So I was wondering why little things like that were missed out. And even when I started to teach at university, because I'm teaching from their syllabus, I have to teach them, uh, teach the students what I've been taught, basically. So I have to go by the syllabus. So I have to go by how, how they say the body works. So I'm going by the same textbooks that confuse me and I'm there teaching the students the same stuff that confused me. So there was a little bit of um, like mental conflict when I was younger with regards to what I was teaching. I, was, I just felt like I weren't really teaching the whole truth. So I started to go on a journey. And this is after I've already completed three years of university. I've got my degree and all that sort of stuff. So I'm thinking I know some stuff, but the more I started to learn science, the more I realized I didn't know. So when I went on my own personal journey and started reading books from Dr. Leila Africa and Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, because she mentions melanin, and Dr. Richard King, and all of these books that mention melanin, then I started to realize, oh, okay, that's why they don't mention this stuff in university. That's why the anatomy and physiology books are so confusing. That's why we as black people even though we all know this thing is called melanin and we all have it, we're all confused about it because no one's really teaching us the truth about it. And so since I started to learn about it, I was making notes, like literally reading books, making notes, making notes, making notes. And I wasn't even thinking about writing a book. I was just trying to understand my melanin. I was just trying to understand how my body works from a black perspective. So I'm making notes, making notes. But remember, I started studying melanin, melanin like 15 years ago. So then um, a friend of mine came out with a melanin book. This was like two years ago. A friend of mine came out with a melanin book. And I was like, wow, man, that's amazing. You got a melanin book on Amazon. And he was like, what are you doing, bro? You need a melanin book, man. You need to come out with your own melanin book. And I was like, I had never even given it a thought to come out with my own melanin book. But I said to him, do you know what? I've already got the book because I've already been making notes for over 10 years. I've literally got all the information. I just need to put it in a structured way. So that's how the book came about. Literally, it wasn't even a thought in my mind until my friend said, bro, come on, you need to make your own book and look how much knowledge and information you've got in it. And I was like, you know what? In my phone, I've got over 10 years worth of melanin research. So I just put it together in a book and try to make it as simplified as possible, just so if people read it, they understand melanin like properly from a black perspective. Wow, that's amazing. Now, that is the kind of friend that everybody needs as a friend. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, because some friends be jealous and they know that yeah. you have it, but they even discourage you when you say that you're going to do something. They're like, ah, no, who are you to even speak nah, about this? You know, good friend, man. shout out to Joe Dash. His book is called The Melanin Effect, by the way. So you guys go get that on Amazon as well. It's called The Melanin Effect. Beautiful, beautiful. I love this friendship. So one of the things that I loved about the book is that you put in so many images and we can actually experience it through the images. And this reminds me of how our ancestors actually wrote in images, you know, mm -hmm. like the Merunetar, the hieroglyphic uh, yeah. writing is images. So this connects to something in our brain. It's like our brains are actually made to communicate better with images. So mm -hmm. when you communicate through images, we're getting it, we're getting the picture. So you put all those images in the book. I mean, it has to be expensive to print because they're yeah. even in colors, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 it was. And I, I self-published the book as well, but um, I felt like, because there's a lot of melanin books out there. Like I said, uh, Dr. Leila Africa has books on melanin, Dr. Richard King, all of these people have written books on melanin, but me coming from a science perspective and me coming from a university kind of science perspective, I need that and the fact that I know how I learn. I'm very visual with how I learn. So a lot of people, they learn by you just telling them. So they're 
auditory. They they learn through audio. Um, people, some most people learn through doing. You have to tell them, and then they do it, and then they learn. But a lot of people are visual, and I think, especially when it comes to science, seeing the body is easier than just being told how the body works. Yeah, and that's the reason why when I was at university, there was a huge disconnect. Because I'm learning, I'm trying to learn how the body works. I'm trying to learn anatomy and physiology. And every time I open up a science book, I don't see anyone who looks like me. So there's a disconnect there. So I was very conscious to ensure that when I made my book, one, I wanted to make it color because melanin is a lot to do with color. And you can read about it and read about how the melanin can absorb all different light frequencies and that sort of stuff. But when you see it, it hits home. It hit, it's kind of different when you see it. When you see the colors going through your eye and how um, all the colors come together to form black, that's when it really hits home, when it's visual. So I was like, okay, if I'm doing this book, I know it's going to be a little bit more expensive than all the usual books because I want color images and I want to make sure that every image is us. So if there's an image of a black woman and she's pregnant, uh, if there's an image of a woman and she's pregnant, it's a black woman, African woman. If there's an image of the brain, it's an African brain. Like you, every image, I want you to connect with the images. So when you're looking at it, and this is simply because of how I was taught, there was a disconnect. So I can't really connect with the images. So when you're picking up this book now, you're literally seeing things that you've never seen before. You're seeing a, a black man and you're seeing inside of his brain and you're seeing the 12 melanin centers that are inside his, his brain. You will never see that in any other science book, anywhere. Um, like literally, there are people who have studied science for many, many years, like neuroscience, which is how the brain works. And they'd read my book and then email me saying, I never knew there was 12 melanin centers in the brain. I've been studying neuroscience, how the brain works, for over 10 years and I've never been taught about these 12 melanin centers in the brain. And again, I could tell you because other books have mentioned it, but when you see it, I think it hits home a bit harder. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I encourage everyone to get the book and just, I think this is the kind of book that also people should be teaching to children from a, an early age. I love how in one of your lectures, you explain how you used to teach to children so you mm -hmm. had to simplify things for children. And then you realize that that's actually even what adults need <laughs> themselves. Yeah. Even we need the things to be simplified. And then yeah. the other thing that I really love about your journey is about, you know, in ancient Africa, they say one of the most uh, valuable thing is to know thyself. So like this journey into knowing yourself and understanding mm -hmm. yourself ends up actually helping everyone else and all of us to mm -hmm. know about ourselves and to understand about ourselves, you know, so I'm loving it. So what is it? Why should we know about melanin and why is it so important? Like if you can just give a, a brief taste to the people of why yeah. it's so important and why we should all know about it. All right, so I'll, I'll try and keep it brief, but following on from what you were saying with regards to knowing ourselves, well, uh, when you're trying to know yourself, like some people say you've got to look in the mirror and really you know, love yourself and that sort of stuff because knowing thyself leads to loving thyself, yeah? So if you want to love yourself, then you've got to know yourself. And when people um, are trying to love themselves, especially in this day and age where they're getting all of these distractions, Looking in the mirror, some people do affirmations when they look in the mirror. I am amazing. Today's going to be a great day. Whatever they say as an, uh, as an affirmation, they're looking in the mirror. And my thing is, when you look in the mirror, what's the first thing you see? Your skin. So part of knowing yourself is knowing how you work. And even though we live in a society that says that, you know, color is not important, you know, you shouldn't judge people by the color of their skin. Um, it's the character that you should be judging. And we shouldn't be looking at color. And you hear people say, oh, I don't see color. What I, what I realized over my 15 years of studying melanin is that in science, 
colour is extremely important in understanding science. Yeah, a lot of the cells they call the cells chromocytes. Chrome means colour. Site means cell. So chromocyte. That's the that's the science terminology for how your cells work. They absorb light in different colours. So my thing was when you look in the mirror, you see a colour. That is your skin and that is part of knowing yourself. So when it comes on to melanin, a lot of us don't know the first thing that we really should know. That thing, what we see when we look in the mirror, that makes us black. We literally don't know that part. And there's been a lot of definitions of melanin over the years. But I love Dr. Leila Africa's definition because it's simple. And I like to keep things super simple when I'm teaching science. Dr. Leila Africa's definition of melanin is it's the chemical key to life. It is the chemical key to life. And that is very important, especially for us as black African people, especially if you're someone who does do research going all the way back to ancient Kemet. You'll understand that um, ancient Kemet was all about life. Yeah. That's why, you know, the unk, the unk represents life. Everything that they've done represented life. Even when it come on, even when it came on to the Medunetta and, and their language and the, the symbols that you see. When people who are not from Kemet came into Kemet, they wanted to try and understand the language, yeah? And for them, language is dead, yeah? So when they look at a symbol, they'll ask people who know, what does this symbol represent or what does this symbol mean? And when it's about life, it could mean a multitude of things, yeah? But when the language is dead, it just means one thing. Oh, that symbol means grass, or that symbol means uh, land. No, that symbol means all various things. For example, um, I think there's a term, oh, I've forgotten what the term is called, but there's a term in ancient Kemet that meant um, flourishing, yeah? It meant greening, yeah? It actually referred to the color green. Now, when they were trying to translate the Medinata, they were like, oh, this word, this term represents the color green. That's dead language. It represented greening. In other words, becoming green. In other words, like plants that become green, like they, they grow and they flourish. So it, it meant greening, becoming green. It meant flourishing and then flourishing can be a metaphor for life. It meant flourishing in life as well. So when you're flourishing, you're growing, you're living, yeah? So with that language, everything was about life. And when we think about that and then take it all the way back to melanin, and Dr. Lady Africa calls melanin the chemical key to life, then now we're talking about the main thing that gives us life, literally. The main thing that gives us life. That means, if you go by that definition, and that's a definition I've gone by since I learned it. If you go by that definition, that means that anything that messes up your melanin means it's going to mess up what? Your, your life. life. Yeah. Wow, that is so amazing. And alluding to ancient Kemet and the whole idea of greening uh, mm -hmm. reminds me how they, the divine beings, the divine selves, they portray themselves as black, but also Osar, the Osiris, the head of the Paut Neteru, sometimes they portray him in green because he also expresses the idea, that idea of flourishing and always right. being a seed that will be planted and then you can have a harvest you know, right. which, which is going through greening. And this reminds me how in our African languages, um, when you, the, 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 the word that you use for the color actually refers to an actual something that is alive. For example, mm -hmm. uh, my African language is Kenya Rwanda from Rwanda and when we the 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 word that we use for the color green is ichati and ichati is directly in reference of the grass and the grass is green 
So right. to express the color green, you say yeah. ichati, which refers to the grass, and the grass is actually green. And right. to express blue, we talk about ubururu, which refers to ijuru, which refers to the sky, heaven, which is blue. Right. And then to express the color uh, brown, we talk about ijitaka, which express the, the ground, the soil, which is brown, you know. Right. And then the, the color black is yeah. umukara, umukara, which refers to ikara, ikara, which is carbon, which yeah. carbon from the 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 charbon that you the the tree which becomes black when it's burned is mm -hmm. actually black you know right. Right. so it's so amazing so i'm thinking that even the english language itself mm -hmm. could be a problem in the process mm -hmm. of understanding because the english language does not have this wealth of when you say green, that it actually refers to something that is green, that is alive, that you can alive. identify. Exactly. So the African language, and this goes all the way back to ancient Kenya, every, every word, every symbol represented life. No symbol or no word represented death. Every symbol, every word, uh, the Medinetta, all the hieroglyphs, Everything represented life because everything was either referring to life or water or plants or something in nature that growing and living, yeah. And that's why the, the language is a living language, yeah. And when you say English, yeah, English makes not only understanding ancient Kemet hard and our history, but it makes understanding science difficult as well because it's a dead language and now. Not only is it a dead language, then they use these confusing terms. They make up these confusing terms on top of it, just so we can't understand what they're saying. So if you don't know what a chrome means, and then you see a word, and you don't know what sight means, when you see chromosite, you're going to think, okay, I've heard that before. That's a scientific term. But when you break it down, these people are telling us, oh, I don't see color. Color is not important. But yet you name your cells color cell. So that's what chromocyte means, color cell. So and then we have also this, uh, this word chromosomes, right? What is chrom? Are we not? I remember learning about chromosomes, and I was like, "What is that?" I, now, now I understand what what they could be. Exactly. So our DNA is made up of because when they say color, we get color from pigments absorbing light. So that's what I mentioned in the book. Anytime you see color, it's because a pigment is absorbing light. So when they say chromosome or chromocyte or cytochrome, they're talking about pigments absorbing light. And I mentioned this in the book. When you break down scientific terminology, literally everything in the body is about pigments absorbing light. You've got so many different types of terminology that have the word chrome in it as the root word. So I'm looking at all this scientific terminology saying, it's all about pigments. So if science is, if the body is all about pigments, like they talk about when you go to university and you learn anatomy and physiology, they talk about the different systems, the, um, the neuromuscular system, the skeletal system, the nervous system, all of these systems, they should have a pigment system. That's one of the systems that they should talk about in your anatomy and physiology classes or books or courses anatomy and physiology should be talking about pigments because it's the light that we absorb from the sun that activates all of the things that happen in our body whether it's hormone secretion or even the flow of blood or something happening in organs any type of metabolism happening that's because a pigment has absorbed light and then activated some type of process Mm, wow, that is so fascinating. And this also takes me to photography. You know, I remember taking a class about photography just so I could understand how to make beautiful pictures. And then I realized that photography is about taking picture of the light. 
And then mm -hmm. when I was reading the, your melanin book, it brought me kind of brought me back to photography because photography is about capturing the light. Mm -hmm. And then when they teach you about the light spectrum, you it also makes you understand melanin. And then when you say, for example, that there are the best times to look at the sun, your, mm -hmm. your, your eyes need sun and they need to absorb sun. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same hours as photography. In photography, they have these hours they call the magic hours, which is the sunrise, the, the little time of the sunrise, and then the little time of the sunset. Those are the magic hours when yeah. the photographers can capture pictures and get the most uh, beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you also say that since we absorb light, because of melanin and our eyes also need to absorb light, then the best hours to absorb that light in our eyes, just like in the camera lens of a photographer, is those hours. Can you talk about that? It's so fascinating. Yeah, it's so fascinating and it's, it's so interesting to learn. When I was learning about, you know, how the, the eyes absorb light and then that's what activates our pineal gland, I was like, wow, because uh, doctors tell us that we shouldn't look at the sun and doctors tell us that the sun is bad for our eyes and that sort of stuff. So when I'm learning this stuff, it's literally the opposite to what I was taught. But then as, uh, the the part that we're talking about is the sunrise and sunset. And I like the term that you use. It's like the magical hours. That is the magical time for your eyes to be absorbing light. The magical time. Because when the sun is rising, when in the morning when the sun rises, um, you're not getting the strong, bright light of like 12 noon, where you literally can't look up at the sun because it's too bright. You're getting what they call infrared light. And when the sun is rising, depending on where you are in the world, you might even see the sun as red or orange. Yeah. And when you see that, it's not intense, but it's very powerful for your health. Like infrared light is so powerful that the people that know about this stuff, like the scientists that really don't really, don't talk about melanin, but they know about melanin, they've now created devices that mimic the sunrise. They 